It's wonderful to look out and see lots of familiar faces. This is be beginning to become a thing in DC. But it's also delightful to look out and see some new faces and people we hope to welcome coming on. I'm Linda Rosen, the CEO of Change the Equation. And we are very excited to have a group of individuals with us this morning who really exemplify the critical role that business education partnerships have, especially in the creation of STEM-focused schools. We're delighted that STEM is the basis of so many conversations now. Um, but it's especially exciting to see the general ideas really coming to fruition for real kids every day at, in their schooling, and that's what we're going to hear about. Business involvement in the development of a new prototype can infuse real innovation into what we see as outdated schooling models, particularly in the 21st century and particularly when we think about STEM. IBM's p -Tech in New York City and Battelle's Metro Early College High School in Columbus, Ohio, truly are models of what a STEM high school can be. And this morning, we'll learn how business involvement in creating STEM-focused schools can form new pathways and innovative opportunities for students in post-secondary schooling and careers that education cannot do alone. I'm going to introduce all of our panelists turn the conversation over to them, and we'll be sure to leave ample time at the end for Q&A. For those of you who've been here before, you know Q&A tends to get very lively here, which is what a salon is all about. So we look forward to your questions and welcome them. On my far left is Grace Sue, Senior Program Manager, Corporate Citizenship and Corporate Affairs, IBM. Grace is part of the team, and listen, because you're going to want to know this, that created Pathways in Technology Early College High School, better known as PTEC. And I have to admit, I didn't know what the acronym stood for, uh, which opened just this year, September 2011. She manages IBM's global STEM initiatives, including TriScience, which provides teachers, students, and parents with access to online experiments and multimedia adventures, and Power Up, a 3D online game designed to teach high school students about engineering and the environment. Grace also developed and manages IBM Mentor Place, a global mentoring program. But before IBM, Grace worked at the Children's Defense Fund. Rashid Davis, the founding principal of PTEC, is a well-known champion for underserved children, creating opportunities where they are limited, and ensuring that his kids get nothing but the best. He brings to P-TECH more than 15 years of experience in New York City public schools as a teacher, assistant principal, and most recently, the principal of Bronx Engineering and Technology Academy, known as BETA. Under his leadership, BETA rose to number 143 on the Newsweek list of 1,500 top American high schools, also receiving accolades from US News and World Report and Good Morning America. So we're del delighted to welcome them for PTEC. David Burns is the director of STEM Learning Networks at Battelle. He works with the Battelle Memorial Institute and is leading the efforts to establish a national STEM network supported by Battelle and the Gates Foundation. But that's not the only reason he's here. He's really here for his work around Metro High School. Prior to his work in the public sector, David spent 15 years in the hospitality business developing multi-million dollar restaurant concepts. You'll give me a rating on breakfast later. <laughs> and executing a wide variety of business plans, including Disney World's Epcot Center. He's led state initiatives in middle and high school transformations at the Ohio Department of Education and was instrumental in Cincinnati Public Schools High School restructuring project. David has focused on the startup and implementation of five statewide STEM platform schools, ensuring creativity and innovation in school design. Amy Kennedy is the principal of the Metro Early College High School. 
Amy's experience as an educator is firmly rooted in the belief that all students can achieve at the very highest levels. She began her teaching career at the Freshman Academy in Canton City, Ohio, one of Ohio's big eight urban districts. She has held leadership roles in Ohio's High School Transformation Initiative, Ohio's Early College Initiative, and Ohio's Literacy Initiative. Amy's varied experiences as a classroom teacher and teacher leader include building quality relationships with diverse groups of stakeholders and designing lessons that are engaging and authentic to her students. With that, let's first look to New York and hear from Grace and from Rashid. Good morning, and we, we do th um, appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk about PTAC. So, oh, that's true. Good morning, once again, we thank you for the opportunity to be here to talk about PTAC. So let me just set the historical context. September 2010, our lovely mayor announced on national television a great partnership of a new IBM high school that would then later turn into PTAC that really came out of a, a unique opportunity for our then chancellor, Joel Klein, who had a very close friendship with Sam Palmasano, who was the president of IBM. And the mayor wanted an opportunity to really create a school that allowed a pathway from high school to industry. So that conversation jump-started um, a media, uh, many other conversations that led to Stan Littow, um, who really was, a, who had a former position as a deputy chancellor in New York City, who now is working at IBM, to really spearhead the opportunity to say, how can we actually come up with a new model high school to really allow for this opportunity? Because IBM did not just do internships for high school students, so there needed to be an intermediary. And so it was important to understand that it wasn't just going to be in a traditional early college experience of grade 9 through 12, that we needed to do something different. And that something different really involved a new formation of a 9 through 14 model. And the 9 through 14 model really includes an, an associate's degree from New York City College of Technology specifically. Because we knew that by looking at the projections by 2018, that students would actually need an IT degree. But if you also pay attention to Bob Schwartz's report, Pathways to Prosperity, you talk about middle skill jobs and middle skills that um, are really needed in looking at students who were actually leaving four-year universities or going to four-year universities and not actually graduating. And so we needed to actually come up with a concept that really took into account preparing students for the future, but also really looking at those soft skills that are needed in terms of from the industry standpoint, but also to be able to give some real value to education to make sure that students actually complete it. So the idea of that, if we made sure that the high school would not stop at grade 12, but actually stop at grade 14. So we are not a traditional 9 through 12 model. It is a 9 through 14, and students are informed that they are expected to be with us for six years. They will leave with a, an AAS in either computer information systems or electromechanical engineering technology. So even though we are an early college school, we are a six-year model with two specific and very narrow AAS degrees. And we are what's called in New York City a limited unscreened school. That means that we do not look at students' academics in order to gain admissions. They do not take a test. They have to attend an information session. And just to complicate matters even further, New York City requires every eighth grader to list 12 choices of schools in terms of for their options. And we tell the students, we really prefer that you rank us one or two of your options, but we don't know which, which place the students actually rank us. But that is their way of actually gaining interest into the school. Then the city has its own placement department to really decide how many students are actually admitted. So we've been meeting since last year in January um, in terms of as a steering committee that included members of IBM, New York City Department of Education, the City University of New York, and specifically New York City College of Technology. For year one, one of the first things that I was dealt with grace is that I wanted a mentor for every single ninth grader. Um, 
because I wanted to make sure that the students could have that aspiration of who we want them to be at the end of six years. And so that way we did not have, we would not have the issue of access in the event that students didn't have an IT professional at home or in their community. So I thought it was critical. As a non-negotiable, as you know, as non, was one thing on the table for me was very clear that I wanted every single ninth grader to have a mentor. IBM had already said they were going to have someone in the building three days a week, that they were going to do field visits, and that we were going to map out a six-year plan for internships, externships, co-op experiences. I said, that's great. But year one, I want every single ninth grader to have their own mentor. And so we went back and forth about how we were actually going to find those. At that particular time, we were saying 122 mentors. But it was important in terms of to, to serve up aspiration because once again, remember we're not academically screening students, so we need something that was a little more powerful to make students really believe that they could actually do this. And so the conversations were and still are very, very rich. Um, IBM has, we have a liaison in the building three days a week who actually works with the staff and teachers conduct, conducting professional development. But first and foremost, what she did was a skills mapping of looking at entry-level positions um, that IBM already has in place and say, what are these skills that these people in these entry-level positions actually bring to the table? And then we work backwards in terms of with college professors, the provost specifically at New York City College of Technology, as well as CUNY and, and teachers, and said, these skills will best be mapped in terms of two, the two associate's degrees that we deal with, computer information systems and electromechanical engineering technology. And through the model, we would hope to gain, give, give students the opportunity to, do, to gain two to three years of work experience. Year one, we knew that we needed to do something different. So year one, our students have four courses, English, math, workplace learning, and technology. They're not taking science and social studies year one. They're not taking that because we know that they're not coming into high school at grade level. So we have to do something different with time to make sure that we're getting their literacy skills as well as numeracy skills together. In workplace learning, every single, ment every single student has the opportunity to, through mentor plays to interact with their mentor. And workplace learning will be built out over the years to include internships, job shadowing, as well as um, that would develop into the co-op experiences in high school, in the college piece. <laughs> So year one, it was critical to pay attention to using time different. So our schedule looks different. First period begins at 8.35, with 10th period ending at 4.06, and enrichment then concluding at 6 o'clock. Then there's Saturday school also from 9 to 1. So the, the idea is that we have to use time different and that to gain, to, to leverage industry as best as possible to make sure that those skills that are needed are embedded in every course and that we can make sure that the conversations are different. And they, we're even trying to see now how do we make sure that teachers can actually see industry completely different so that way the pedagogy is not the same. These are, um, of course, not something that's going to miraculously happen overnight. Um, you know, teaching is already a tough job as it is and to have teachers give up their control and also to learn new skill sets that are required for this STEM-focused model is something that we're looking forward to still developing. Thanks, Rashid. Um, I want to build on what Rashid said, and, and not to get us off track, but I, I wanted to dial back a little bit and talk about IBM and, and why we're in this in the first place. And those of you out there in the audience who know us well know that we've been involved in education for a long time. Um, we ran the 1996, 1999, and 2001 National Education Summits. Um, that focused on high academic standards and the roles that states played. Um, and you know, now in 2012, we're, we're really looking at national standards and change the equation is playing such an important part in that. Um, but we've always been focused on systemic change and how can we create change for all students and not just a lucky few. So our work in, you know, in P-TECH might seem like a departure from some of the things that we've been doing. And we've got programs like Teachers Try Science, which focuses on global professional development. And we've had reinventing education in the past. But P-TECH really, um, really is in line with all of our efforts. Um, we see this as the beginning of change, as, as the first in a series of schools 
that will happen nationally. And PTEC is actually already being replicated um, in Chicago. Mayor Rahm Emanuel announced that there's going to be five new schools, and one of those will be a school run by IBM. So this is first in first in a movement of of schools um, with the acknowledgement that it's really important to connect school, college, and career, and that we have to prepare schools, prepare our students not just for post-secondary education, but for careers as well. They're not two different tracks. And that um, we, for kids to be successful, we have to work together as partners in the, in the K-12 system, in the higher education system, and business must be at the table. And we have to be at the table, um, and not just with cash, but things that we know and do well. So when this opportunity came to us, and it really, it was so much the brainchild of Stan Littow, who Rasheed mentioned is the president of um, the IBM International Foundation and vice president of corporate citizenship and corporate affairs at IBM. Um, you know, it was this, this opportunity for us to do something really innovative um, that united these three sectors together. Um, so one of the one of the first things we did was we assembled the staff that would be working very closely with, with Rashid, even before Rashid was brought on board. Um, and Rashid, so it stands very intimately involved in the school. I'm working on the school and, and Rashid mentioned Tamika Simpson, who is our project manager and she's really our dedicated solely to the school and ensuring IBM's commitments to the school and also helping Rashid, the staff and the faculty um, and the students ensure the long-term success of the school. And then what Rashid also mentioned is, you know, one of the first things that we did was the skills mapping piece um, because one of the commitments that IBM has made to Rashid and the students and their parents is that when students graduate from PTEC, they will be first in line for jobs at IBM. And that commitment really, you know, has to mean something and we have to infuse it with something. And for it to mean something, that means that when students have that mm -hmm. associate's degree, it means that they are career ready. They're ready to slide into a job at IBM that's going to lead them up a career ladder. So they have to be prepared with skills that matter. So what we did is we um, went back and we looked at all the skills, all the jobs at IBM that required an AAS degree. And there were literally thousands and thousands of skills associated with them. And we boiled them down to a manageable set. And um, we then worked with Rashid and the staff and the faculty at both the high school level and the college level to map those skills to the curriculum. So that was a really critical piece. Um, and this is something that, you know, it's, it's not done. Um, IBM, actually our HR folks are changing those skills monthly. There's some 9,000 skills that change every month. And we can't prepare for the jobs of today. We have to look toward 2016, 2017. And what are the jobs of the future? What are the growth areas within IBM? Business analytics, cloud computing, things which are cutting edge today when these kids graduate might be just skills that you know, we all need just to function in our everyday, day-to-day -day lives. So that's a really important piece for us. Um, the other part of IBM's commitments, I kind of think about under this giant workplace learning umbrella, which is such an important part of the school, as Rashid talked about, there's these strands of the school and workplace learning is a, is a key component of that. And, you know, we've all heard kids say, like, oh, why am I learning this? Why does it matter? How does this connect to my future. Well, workplace learning can help students really understand that. It can connect what they're learning in school to post-secondary education, to careers, and really to being active citizens of the 21st century. And that's what the workplace learning curriculum does. So IBM had a role in developing this curriculum um, and saying what were both the workplace competencies and the technical competencies that would re be required in the sixth year course. Um, and then to support that curriculum are a lot of things that IBM is doing. And Rashid mentioned mentors. So all of our 103 students have mentors. Um, one of the best days that I think I saw at PTEC was when we had 100 mentors descend upon Brooklyn, New York. And 
the noise level in the school of the mentors and the students talking together and having these rich conversations and getting to know one another to kick off the year of mentoring, which happens primarily online, um, was great. And we're going to see them again in about a week and a half. They're going to come to Brooklyn again um, as our end of the year celebration. And so that's been a really key piece. They're serving as caring adult role models um, for the kids and helping them understand um, what's there for them at the end of the road. When you're 14 years old and you have six years ahead of you, it can seem like an eternity. Um, <laughs> for me, I know it's gonna, you know, it'll be here tomorrow, but you know, how do you keep kids on that track and really, and help keep them inspired and keep them going? And, and a mentor can really help do that. Um, and the other thing that um, Rashi mentioned is workplace visits. We've taken the kids out to IBM Research. They got to see some, some cutting edge things that um, IBM Research are doing. Um, they got to talk to engineers. We brought them out to Fishkill, which is our manufacturing site. And they talked to some of our newest employees, some of our older employees. Um, they saw manufacturing at work, even though those aren't really necessarily the jobs that we're preparing students for, but they got to see what it's like to be in a corporate atmosphere. In subsequent years, workplace visits, as students get older, so when we're more in year four or five, they're gonna become internships and then full-blown apprenticeships. So they're gonna have the opportunity to, the technical skills that they're learning at P-TECH, they're gonna have the really opportunity to practice them hands-on in a real work setting where it matters and where they're gonna have to really demonstrate those 21st century skills that they have been honing over the past six years. Um, other things that IBM is doing, um, we are going to be building a technology solution for P-TECH. Rasheed and I have no idea what that's going to be, but we're thinking about that and, and going to be trying to fill a gap for the school. Um, and um, we've been also just helping with the model. You know, what, how, what does workplace learning mean? How can we take what we've learned now and so we don't have this single jewel in Brooklyn, New York, because it is a jewel. Um, but how do we then take this jewel and spread it? You know, how do we make Chicago a jewel? How do we create other jewels throughout the United States? Um, so we have a guide. If you go to citizenibm.com, um, you'll find a guide for, it's based upon what we've learned in this first year, and we're still learning. Um, so we're going to refine the guide over time. But it's something that um, other businesses, educators at, at the at the K-12 and, and college level can download and, and use as they um, want to explore this model and consider replicating it. Um, and you know, we're going to be sharing things. Um, Rashid is very generous with his thought leadership. Um, we have curriculum. We've got... Um, you know, we have things that stuff that we've been <laughs> that we've been developing, and um, and we don't believe that you know we we learn from from Amy, um, and you know that's the importance I think about about these kinds of models that um, we need to be transparent and open and share what we've learned. Um, so, so thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Amy Kennedy. I'm the principal at Metro. Metro is a small school in Columbus, Ohio. We are located on the campus of The Ohio State University. So we are a STEM and we're an early college. Metro was founded in 2006 through um, a partnership between Battelle and The Ohio State University and the districts in Franklin County. Um, we are non-selective in our admission process as well. So as long as you're promoted to ninth grade, you can come to Metro. Metro is a nine through 12 school. Uh, we have about 100 students in each grade level. Our curriculum is designed at the high school level to accelerate the credit earning opportunities so that students can attend college for as generally for two years. We have some students who earn a whole bunch of credits because they master their courses really quickly. 
And then we have some students who uh, maybe take one college class or none. Sometimes it takes kids four years to graduate from high school, which is kind of what everyone else is doing, but um, <laughs> seems like a long time at Metro. 82% uh, of our kids do get college credit before they leave us. Um, just a small example about how quickly students can accelerate at Metro. We had a student in our previous graduating class, um, just the class of 2011, who graduated in June as a high school senior, and she entered The Ohio State University in the fall as a senior in college because she had earned so many credits. Um, in order to earn your credits, you have to earn them at mastery. So Metro is a mastery school. Uh, it just We believe that it takes students different amounts of time to earn mastery, and so you shouldn't be punished with a poor grade or a poor GPA or a one-shot deal if it takes you a little bit longer to learn something at the level that you really need to have access to the careers of the 21st century. Like P-TECH, we know that we're preparing students for jobs that probably don't exist right now. We don't really know what the jobs are. So it's really important that students leave us with a certain amount of college knowledge, right? Like they can solve equations and they can perform experiments and they can read a complex text. But it's also equally important that students leave us with a really strong foundation of skills. And those skills we call the Metro Habits. Things like problem, being an active problem solver, approaching things with a sense of inquiry, being a critical thinker, uh, being an effective collaborator and communicator. All of those habits are deeply embedded in all of the classes that we have at Metro. So every class at Metro is a STEM class. Uh, we don't say like we're STEAM or it's STEM and plus Spanish or something like that. Everything at Metro is a STEM class because every class should be incorporating those habits because in the world you don't need language in little or you don't need knowledge in silos you need knowledge in a really integrated way so um we um i totally lost my train of thought we um so batel is a partner of ours and certainly they help us in pretty um transparent ways like internships, research opportunities, content area expertise, um, being evaluators for student presentations. But the deeper influence of Battelle that you can see at a school like Metro is this sort of fresh perspective on education and a fresh perspective on decision making and deciding, you know, what's the school year going to look like? What's the school day going to look like? What's the work going to look like in the school? When those kinds of decisions are influenced by folks who are not traditional educators, not someone who's been a superintendent for 30 years, um, the, the questions that they ask are different and the decisions that you end up making at the school are different than what happens in a regular kind of school setting. Um, I think another piece of the work that Battelle, another piece of the, another influence that Battelle brings to the work we're doing at Metro is this sort of emphasis on um, what's next. So yes, that was really great. You know, we have really great numbers, but what's next? What's the future hold? Where, what's the next decision that we need to make? Um, how can we work in a network kind of situation where a lot of schools in the state of Ohio are doing similar work? How can we connect folks together? How can we even look with a national lens and think about what are other schools all over the United States doing and how can we connect folks in that sort of lens? So that uh, sort of um, wide reach of Battelle has definitely benefited the work that we are doing at Metro. Good morning. Um, as usual, I'm going to bounce all over the map, but uh, <laughs> Battelle is a research and development company. They use the tagline, business is innovation. Uh, their business is innovation. And they like really big, sticky problems. And public education is a really big, sticky <laughs> problem. <laughs> So on one notion, I'd love to tell you our commitment to the Metro High School is a wonderful thing, and that's true. But if you have the resources of a Patel Memorial Institute and the Ohio State University and you cannot do a school for 400 kids, give me a break. That's what it's about. So the biggest issue is how do you move that to scale 
on a regional, statewide, and national level? What's the business involvement? What is the K-12 involvement? And here's the new one. What's the post-secondary involvement in the game? And how do those three people have to participate or those three entities to make it work for kids? Um, I'm going to bounce back about 10 years. Cincinnati, Ohio was infamous for having something called the riots. It was a bad day in Cincinnati. Cincinnati Public Schools were in the height, they were right in the middle of all of that. As a matter of fact, the kids were throwing rocks at our schools. I happened to be within Cincinnati Public Schools. A group called Cincinnati Bell came in and said, we want to do something about this. And it really taught us something about business involvement with schools because business wanted to come in and do a plan and then leave six months later and it was okay. K-12 wanted to say, you know, we can't change, we got to do all the rules and regulations. And then somebody asked the University of Cincinnati to participate as well. That really taught us how, uh, at least me personally, how business had to be committed for the long run. And I will say it's been probably 10 years now, Cincinnati Bell's still involved. So if you take anything away from whatever this conversation, if you're in for an inch, you're in for the whole thing. These are kids we're talking about. So you can't do something for three months and then walk away from it. That's one of the things that, that Patel has learned within working with Metro, uh, six year now. Mm -hmm. We're not going anywhere, Ohio State's not going anywhere, and we're learning all the time. But we're taking those learnings and we're trying to move it to other areas in Ohio. Metro is located in Columbus. We now have, however you want to count, nine schools, but they're in the large urban districts. They're in the Clevelands, they're in the Cincinnati's, they're in the Dayton, they're in the Akron. Why are STEM schools in urban areas? Because that's where stuff is. IBM is in those places. Battelle is in those places. Procter & Gamble is in those places. We have a huge problem in Ohio. We don't know how to move it to the rural area. It's a huge problem. But we're not going to just walk away from it. We're trying to figure out how to move what things you have in the urban areas out to the, the rural. Not only are we interested in it in Ohio, but the state of Tennessee is interested in that. And the state of North Dakota is interested in that. The state of California is interested in that. So what we're trying to do is expand whatever we learn in Ohio to move it out, not to solve the problem. We'll be the first ones to tell you we're not solving it, but at least work together through a common interest. The business aspect of this has to come in, uh, and uh, I'll give choose. Linda did a great job, 42 states two weeks ago. None of us have unique problems. <laughs> we, we, we're all facing the same. Capacity is huge. Where are you going to get your science teachers? Where are you going to get your math? You know, Patel has, I believe, 40-some thousand scientists. Can we use some of that science expertise to move into the schools? Can we help the rural? We're not solving the problems, but we're getting the vested interest in and what we are asking from Battelle, and, and we're, we're, we're trying to launch a multi-state effort, is if you're a business and you want to participate, A, please participate for the long run. B, this isn't just about money. It's about the skills and the capacity that you bring and expertise to ask Amy and to ask the principal the right questions to move us forward. We need help. Our kids need help but we're not a charitable organization. <laughs> we are professionals on the uh, our, our side of education, so it has to be a professional conversation about how to move this forward. Business helps us, but it's not just charity and it's not just funding, it's the expertise. We have found in our statewide and national network, when businesses work within their wheelhouse, when they're doing things that they normally do, that's the best kind of partnership. Procter & Gamble, runs all their mid-managers through innovation training. We have teachers going through their innovation training. Uh, General Electric in Cleveland has examples of people, um, students being mentored by engineers within the school. Something that was easy for them to do because they're on the same campus. Our business model is don't bring money, bring your skills, bring your expertise, and be in the long haul. With that, I will. Here's our time to ask lots of questions. Let me start 
uh, with one question from me while you're formulating your own ideas. So many people say that the only way to have innovative schools is to take them outside of the traditional school system, either through charter schools or through private schools. You're smiling at Richard, you knew this one. <laughs> um, E-Tech and Metro Early uh, College High School are neither charter nor private schools. So I'd like you to talk about the challenges that you face in putting them within a public school district. And generally, how do you create innovative schools within a traditional system? Whoever would like to take the first stab. Maybe people could silence their cell phones. Well, um, that's a that's a great question. I think that it it can happen at multiple levels, right? So uh, something that we're doing in Ohio is Metro is forming these small little partnerships with other very traditional districts and buildings and their small programs where we have a teacher at the home district and a teacher at Metro and kids who are together and their STEM focused, early college focused half day programs. So it could be something uh, as you know granular as that, even though that's it's really a big undertaking to get that all done. But it's a teacher and a teacher in a room and some space, and you kind of you know work together. But I think that um, the network idea has a really powerful play in that question because all the leaders, why Rishi can speak for himself, but I know a lot of principals in regular traditional schools, right? And so if we have a network of STEM schools and I kind of reach out to the principals and the leaders in those schools and they kind of reaching out, reaching out, the innovation can spread in a way that's not such a formal top down, hey, we're all gonna be a STEM school, this is what you have to do to do that. And you have to be willing to leave your comfort zone to go where the best practices are. We visited Metro last year before um, getting off the ground. So in our planning stage, we came to Cincinnati, um, spent time at, at Amy's school, and, and, and saw the unique relationship that Patel had and, and saw what could we steal from that. Uh, we went to MC2 in Cleveland, Ohio, to see you know what could we learn. So it's about knowing that you don't have all the answers, um, seeing what works, and actually leaving your comfort zone to have those conversations, have conference calls, webinars, take advantage of the technology and say, you know what, we're going to learn from the best, we're going to, to take what we can, make it our own, and, and be willing to share, but not think that we could only be the best by remaining in our own local area. So we, we don't necessarily have to be charter or private, but we could still take some things that, as it relates to how do you structure time, how do you structure professional development that are used in charter and private schools and actually try to make the most of them? And that's just one last piece on that. Within Ohio, the Ohio STEM Learning Network, each of the schools, all different kinds of models, public models, in-district models, charter models, program models. The, the notion here is to learn from those and actually drive state policy. Mm -hmm. What we've learned from to, to change and broaden. We have problems in Cleveland, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but that just doesn't mean we hit the wall and walk away. We actually inform state policy on how to handle those problems when you can make an argument. We've got some professional leaders that are saying this policy is inhibiting kids from teaching and learning. And I would just say, you know, the New York City public schools, they, you know, they have a very active seat at our steering committee. We meet on a on a monthly basis and, and more often. Um, and their, their thinking and their creativity in helping to develop the model has been really vital. Um, we've had Julian Cohen from, from New York City DOE has been a really constant presence for us. Um, which has been very valuable. And New York City is now starting three more schools. Um, so so we, you know, we feel like we are leading the way, um, but that, that we have support as well. Right. So let's get some questions. We have a mic that's coming around. Okay, that's right. Sure. Right here. If you could identify yourself, please. I'm Roberta Stanley with the National School Boards Association. Um, it's no secret that our public higher ed institutions are being starved right now, and I'm sure Ohio State is. Um, what I'm curious about, you also have these different <clears throat> pupil accounting systems in the states, and I know that 
places like Battelle and IBM can be generous, but if you really want to spread throughout the state, how does the funding mechanism work? Is it a combination of both post-secondary and K-12 funding? Um, how, how do you put that together? Is the question Metro's funding or Metro to Ohio State? I think a combination thereof, actually. You know, I know different states operate differently. We have 50 different formulas, but, you know, you might want to talk about Ohio and New York and how you do that. Uh, so the Metro funding model is in evolution uh, as we speak. <laughs> Metro is currently a program of multiple districts in Franklin County. So right now, districts send us uh, money for each kid, and the kids come to Metro. That's all changing for next year. We'll be um, a public STEM school, so we'll be eligible to get the money right from the state per kid. Is, is that the per what we get from the districts? No. It's a percentage. What is the percentage? It's not a percentage. It's a flat rate, around six thousand seven hundred dollars. What would the normal rate be in a normal city? Well, districts in the our region are spending anywhere from nine to sixteen thousand dollars a kid at, per year. Yeah, you're focusing on STEM, which would be more expensive. I think Rashid said some interesting things about using time and personnel in different ways. So, uh, the early college model that we have has kids leaving the building and taking classes at Ohio State and the, how that all works and what that means to Ohio State in terms of their funding has been legislated so they don't see a difference between an early college kid and a regular kid in their total funding and so we're paying a little bit of tuition to Ohio State for those kids when they go there but we're not having that kid sit in an AP class right with a teacher and AP books and all that stuff that sometimes goes on when you have a traditional model and you have students for all four years. So we're not keeping them in that same way. Now, we certainly have contributions from our um, our partner. But our, our spending, we're spending around $10,000 a kid. So we're well below half in our region. What's very interesting is makes us think differently of funding. K-12 funding is a, to achieve a high school diploma. Mm -hmm. Rashid is not going for a high school diploma. She's not going for a high school diploma. So if you have a different end result, you have to pay differently. And actually, Ohio right now is looking at policy that is weighted funding for early college classes, which I think will be driving a lot of different mm -hmm. states looking in that direction. In, in New York City, we um, there is a memorandum of understanding between the City University of New York and the New York City Department of Education that really takes care of the associate's degree. But what's important for us in terms of for the, the collaboration with IBM is really the value of intellectual capital and how do we make sure that we leverage that in terms of from the adults who come from IBM through the planning stages, the curriculum piece, but also through the mentoring. So that way we can make sure that the teachers have access to um, a different type of professional development that really makes teaching and learning different from, from a STEM perspective, also, also also preparing for industry. Also, even for my own leadership, how do I make sure I have a mentor from IBM so that we could push my thinking? How do I make sure I have access to other IBM professionals like Grace, um, like Stan, who really then could push my thinking of how to look at time differently, how to network differently, so that way we're not just looking at dollars and cents, but we're paying attention to the intellectual capital that really exists in all walks of life. Toby? Um, I am standing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm school teacher. Um, I'm Toby Horn uh, from the Carnegie Academy for Science and Education. Uh, I'm getting ready to cry. We work in DC schools. And we would love for the federal labs to be able to do these kinds of programs with you. I, I'm in science, and we have lots of federal labs here. So if anybody wants to help this model, that would be great. I have two questions. One is about teacher licensure. I'm one of those who crossed over from the other side and <laughs> got licensed by means other than coursework. Um, and the other thing is about the so-called state exams. Are you given a dispensation for a couple of years? Um, we, our students take the Ohio exam when it's given, they do quite well on it. Um, we don't really focus, a, we don't really focus a lot on the Ohio exam and content standards. We're much more geared to the ACT or ACT end of course exams. So national 
we norm test and college going exams. Um, our, the teachers at Metro are all licensed. How they got licensed is different. I mean, some people did alternative licensure. Some people did a traditional four year license in an MED. Some did a four year, just a license. So they all have a license to teach what they teach, but how they got it is all different. Um, of course, every teacher has to be New York State certified, and we are actually right now looking for uh, some of the best technology education teachers around the country, and we do have postings in Education Week um, and other opportunities. So if any of you are out there looking for a job and want to come to New York City, we really appreciate that opportunity. Um, in terms of state exams, um, our students are expected to take two college classes year two. And in order to take those college classes and not need remediation, they have to meet the state benchmark, or CUNY's benchmark, of 75 on the English language arts regions or an 80 or higher on the integrated algebra regions. I should tell you that the English language arts regions are generally offered in grade 11. Our students are taking the first term in high school. And so we have to use time differently. We have to use professional development differently. We have to use strategies that are different, online learning. And so we use online tools like Achieve 3000, Math Excel. So that way, within our 90 minutes of teaching, um, the students actually have personalized learning. So that way, we can meet them where they are to be able to really accelerate them at different levels. Well, I just, you know, Rashid has. Um He's constantly assessing where students are. So in the first semester, correct me, Rashid, I'm gonna, but there were two, two math classes. This spring, there's five, because he's constantly ensuring that he's providing students the learning that they require. And so when you, you know, the, the puzzle of trying to put kids into the right classes and make sure that they're accelerating or getting the, the supports that they need. I mean, it, it's really amazing. David, right over here. Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning. I'm David Temple, and I'm an independent consultant formerly with the National Science Foundation. These are amazing, exciting portraits that you're all painting this morning, and you know, just creates a whole new, exciting imagination about things that can happen. But there's a piece that I haven't heard mentioned, and that's the parents. Where are the parents in all of this? Well, the parents are excited for a free associate's degree, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's, <laughs> and so that's why they're saying, um, you know, really, the parents um, are very, very excited about this opportunity. But that's an education piece that we have to constantly do to make sure that habits are changed, like not asking for working papers for their 13 or 14 year old, um, not thinking of using summer in a traditional way, not asking your child to take your younger sibling to and from school that could impact their after school studies, um, understanding really that this is a, their students are, their children are on scholarship now. And so it's ongoing financial literacy conversations that are constantly taking place. And even one of the struggles in terms of with the reality of me of wanting every student to have a mentor, but I'm quite sure you who have children of your own, you tell children to be leery of adults, right? So imagine now uh, 13 and 14 year olds trying to have conversations with mentors who they don't know and the disconnect in terms of the time that it takes for that. So it's a lot of ongoing education, bringing parents, not only bringing parents to the school, but actually taking the school to the parents and making them feel comfortable. It, it's so much work that still needs to happen um, that we are definitely looking for other organizations so that way they don't sabotage this opportunity. And being honest with parents and saying that some of the major contributors to why students may not be successful are what's happening in the home and making sure that they, are under, they, they understand that they are a value and vital part of this collaboration, that it won't work if we don't have their support. Ditto. <laughs> and on a policy level, the, um, we do something that just drives people insane. We don't define what STEM education is. So every local STEM looks different in Cincinnati than it does in Raleigh, than it does in Austin. So the, pam the family, the community, the business defines what STEM looks like for that particular region. So it, they actually own it. And, and we don't say, you should take Metro or you should take the school and put it right here. 
what does STEM look like for you and how does it work? And that's where the, the parent community voice comes in. I don't know everybody's name yet. I'm trying. Hi, I'm Peter. Hi, Peter Gutmacher from the DC Children Youth Investment Trust Corporation. I have a question for Grace and Rashid. What does the contact look like between young people who are working towards their associate degree in P-TECH and young people who are already in IBM uh, situations who have that degree and are, and are, you know, who are working? Is there any kind of mentorship that goes on from the people who are already in and the people who are coming up? Um, we have mentors, the mentors that are currently in our program come from all areas of the company and they span age ranges, ethnicities, and backgrounds. We have people from IBM Legal. We also have people in the areas that students could potentially work, like software group or a global business consulting group. Um, and we have a number of, we have vice presidents, and we also have a number of young people. We have this program at IBM called Consulting by Degree which gives um, young people right out of school the opportunity to try different areas within the company. And um, they're a part of our mentor program in, in, a, in a really good representation. Um, so we have brought young people to the table and, and through workplace visits, they've had the opportunity to visit um, with young hires as well. So. So re, um, last year during the planning stage, we had the opportunity to, to have a New York City graduate actually from IBM who really was working with us in terms of coming to our orientations and telling students about her New York City experience, but also her computer science experience. And so parents as well as students had the opportunity to hear from a New York City graduate who actually is currently working at IBM. So for since we're in ninth grade, that sets a different context in terms of to know that students from New York City Public School really can have a, a type of opportunity. But it's really, it's mentoring in, at all levels. It's not just the mentors at IBM. Every single adult in the school mentors students as well. Um, so we can make, so we wanna make sure that and every single student will have a college mentor. So it really will have like a, a triangle effect to make sure and then they will also have to reach back and mentor someone in middle school so that it's constantly trying to help them change their habits but also mature in a way that's different. Mentoring is a very, very um, sophisticated uh, and a different level of networking. And when you take a 13 or 14 year old who are told to be skeptical of adults and who are not traditionally seeing themselves as college ready because they've heard they're not smart, it, there's a learning curve that has to actually take place to deal with that social maturity that needs to happen. And it doesn't happen year one as you're trying to accelerate to pass state exams, as well as the, they're trying to get adjusted to high school. So we know that within the six year time frame that we will see different, um, a different level of maturity over time and they will be able to appreciate the different levels of mentoring that are being provided. One other thing that we've done that's related is we're talking to hiring managers about you know, what is it that you see in the young people that you hire? You know, yeah. What are those important skills and attributes that they have? Because when these kids graduate, they're going be you know, they're going to be quite young um, and their skills are still developing and we're going to have to continue to support them just like we support just like I get supported at IBM still in my career. Um, so, you know, I think it's it's very important for us to understand you know where they're going to be, um, and what is it that what is that somewhat intangible thing that, that you look for in a successful candidate with IBM. Um, so talking to different people at different levels within the company. Let's do Peggy. Save Celia some steps. Thank you. Hi, I'm Peggy Siegel. I'm the consultant with Change the Equation. Uh, two quick questions. Um, Dave, you had mentioned identifying policy barriers. Can you give some examples of what that looks like and the impact or results? And secondly, um, what's so great about this is the, the effort of both Ohio and New York to capture in real time, make transparent, lessons learned. I'm wondering if there's an equal opportunity to capture as businesses are going through this, what they're learning 
that makes effective partners and making that transparent to be able to scale on the business quote accountability end as well. Thank you. Uh, probably lean on Amy for a couple of these, but Metro is a partner with the state of Ohio. They test things. A couple of things they've tested is credit flexibility. And we're, we're learning how to do daytime Carnegie units, you know, don't work. <laughs> so the state came up with a credit flexibility po mm -hmm. policy. Metro was one of the first schools to adopt the policy and to utilize the policy. Amy said something about mastery. Well, what does the heck does that mean? It means every kid gets an A. So is it an easy school? No. And do you just use a standardized test? No. You use performance-based assessments. Mm -hmm. State is grappling with performance-based assessments. Well, a good place to look at them is with real kids doing real mm -hmm. performance-based assessments to see how it functions and does it correlate with ACT scores and everything else. So those are the, the two big policy. How do we function within the school system as it is, and how do we break those barriers? Uh, some that we're right now in the middle of are the um, teacher evaluation pilots and the performance-based compensa performance compensation pilots that are um, the state is testing out and the value-added stuff as well. So. One of the pieces of an identity of a school, you know, a STEM school like Metro is you have to be willing to try many things at once. And so, yes, we're gonna try performance-based compensation and we're gonna try value-added and we're gonna do the um, performance pilot for students and we're all gonna do it all at the same time. So that we can have feedback really at the policy level and so we can know what's coming and so we can push our agenda a little bit if there's something that we want or so we can adjust quickly. <laughs> so we are a six year model. So what does a cohort accountability look like when you're asking students to remain in high school for six years? So that's a conversation um, that will still have to be tackled um, at year four for our students to remain in high school for two additional years because the cohort accountability that traditionally is in place will not work for us. And uh, we are part of, in New York City, what's called the innovation zone. So we do use online learning in there. Um, the state has been very privy to allow waivers in terms of to make sure that if as long as how we define mastery, which is not the same way that Metro defines mastery, that students can actually use blended, teachers can use blended learning in terms of as an online approach to be able to award credit. That's traditionally 54 hours for one credit. Let me follow up with a question to the two business folks, and that is what's sort of the most humbling lesson you've taken from the partnership, and also what is the proudest lesson that you've taken from it? Um, gosh, the most humbling, it's, it's hard. Gosh, it's hard. And, um, and I think that, um, I was saying to someone this morning that, you know, I've, I've done a lot of work in education and I've read a lot about it, but when you're really um, building a school and on the ground and seeing the challenges that great principals face and their teachers and staff, um, it's humbling to see their the amount of dedication that they have and and it and for I think for all of us that are working on this at IBM you know we feel so that it's, it's incredibly incumbent upon us not to not to let this fail um, and to do everything that we possibly can to help p -Tech succeed and to create um, opportunities for others other schools like this to flourish um, and so that's been also, I guess, the op the you know the opposite side is that um, it's it's been incredibly inspiring. Um, it's I've learned a lot about great leadership um, and vision, and and how you help kids, um, especially the most historically underserved kids, and get them on the road to success, um, and help propel them into the middle class. And I, I think that that's what this really promising model is doing. Our uh, most humbling moment was we actually thought businesses cared what happened in Columbus, Ohio, which is the state capital. And 
we uh, it came crashing down upon us that business could possibly care less what happens in the, as far as their own local neighborhood. They care deeply about what happens in Cincinnati, Akron, Dayton, that their neighborhood they really cared about. So the flip side of that was when there was a need for advocacy at the state level and it impacted them on a local basis, they came out in droves. So uh, one year we asked them all to come, didn't get anything back. The next year it was impacting the local level. They came in droves and changed state policy. And so it was a very empowering, but it taught us how to work with business. More questions? Um, back here. I'm Sonia Ortega from National Science Foundation. I have a very loud voice, so, but I'm Sonia Ortega from National Science Foundation, and I was very pleased to hear about the involvement of industry uh, with the schools. And for many years, NSF has run a program that is doing what David was mentioning, and it's linking the higher education with the schools. And what we were missing was the industry um, participation. Now we have the whole triangle, and uh, we're in the process right now of developing best practices and uh, lessons learned and uh, preparing a handbook that will be available in the, uh, in the fall. We'll be very happy to share it with Change the Equation and the industry participants so you can, you can uh, continue to build on your experiences and in our experiences. But I have a question also. So that said, I have a question for the New York team. And uh, you mentioned the um, getting the students and with an AS degree. And uh, my question is, how do you, how does IBM encourage the students to go beyond the a AS degree, to go into graduate school and go into master's degrees, PhDs, so they don't stay working at the bottom? Um, well, the, if students choose to go beyond the AS3, we're not saying that when they earn their AS3, they're coming right into careers. You know, if they want to go on and finish their post-secondary degrees, um, we certainly encourage that. But I think it's really important to note that this is not a, a track for students that are underperforming that's going to keep them on that track and, and, and keep them in poverty or, you know, in low-income tracks. Um, we are preparing them with a rigorous set of skills that are going to prepare them for real careers at IBM or other similar jobs in the IT field. Um, so this is not a school for the low performing. This is, is, is an incredibly rigorous model and the demands upon the students are very high. Um, you know, they're going to be taking, we have our first set of kids who are going to be taking college classes this summer. So I don't want to underestimate the value of the AAS degrees that they're going to get. And we know that um, in the next 10 years, 14 million jobs are going to be created that require at least an associate's degree, and that many jobs are going to be requiring an associate's degree, and that can be something that can propel you into the middle class. So I just, I just did want to make sure that we, we were really clear about, about that aspect. And, and I just want to clarify that um, if you look at reports that by age 25, I would say maybe they say maybe 30 percent of the nation has a four-year degree, but when you look at students of color, that 30 percent is even less, and it would say single digits. And so, if we're able to make sure that uh, more than 95 percent students who are of color can actually leave with a two-year completed AAS, they will earn more over their lifetime in terms of then many people, of course, would not. And so it, we're preparing, even though we're preparing them to earn the AAS, we know that the expectation is that the AAS will make them more successful to complete the BS. Because first and foremost, they have to get there. And so we're working with the, with the idea in mind that we want you to have the most education possible, but you're going to leave with this completed AAS, which is a benchmark and a foundation that's different from others who would only leave with a high school diploma. And so um, they, uh, they should have greater options and not necessarily trapped in any um, opportunity. And many of these students on are first generation. And so to have the opportunity to go, if they choose to go to industry as opposed to going directly to a BS, will be a win-win either way. Gerhard. 
Well, remember now, this is in the first year of school, so you've only got one one class. Um, so we might have to stay tuned to see as, <laughs> as these youngsters move through. Gerhard up here. I'm Gerhard Salinger, also NSF. I, I, you would certainly have a lot of good plans and, and seem to have a lot of success, but I have a lot of colleagues who are methodologists. Mm -hmm. And so what I was wondering was, what are your plans for research and evaluation studies to, to if you want, prove to the methodologist that you're doing what you say you're doing? Yeah, uh, <laughs> sure. Actually, we are um, in the middle of many studies. Just like we're in the middle of many pilots and policy initiatives, we're in the middle of many studies. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think it starts at the ground level with being open and, it, being open and willing to be studied and researched, certainly since uh, because of our location and our relationship with uh, the Ohio State University, we should be prime targets for research opportunities. So um, there have been studies done around the school culture, uh, sort of ethnographic qualitative studies. We are also involved in quantitative studies around, um, you know, we're a lottery school to get in, so there's a certain pool of students who applied but didn't get in, so that work is being done. Um, the there's a new center being developed at Ohio State and then it's brand new it's a data center at the John Glenn School of Public Policy and so we I I'm pretty sure we're going to be their first study out of there around uh, comparative data students in our school and then like students in surrounding districts so um, we are happy to be studied and published about we, um, for both associates degree, computer information systems as well as electromechanical engineering technology, uh, both degrees require students to take pre-calculus, to be prepared to take pre-calculus. If not, there are two additional math classes that they have to meet. So to take an open enrollment population and to make sure that they are prepared for pre-calculus for either AAS is definitely worthy of a study to see the benefits of using time differently in year one, because we will have some students as a result of using time differently in year two actually into pre-calculus because we're able to go deeper in terms of in math because we're not doing the other courses within that time frame. So we definitely welcome the opportunity in terms of to someone who wants to come and work full time on our staff um, paid for by NSF um, <laughs> to, to, to watch us for the next five years. We appreciate that. <laughs> and IBM actually at, at the beginning of this process did invest um, working with the Center for Children and Technology to document the first year of our school. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to consider what those next steps will be. I would point out that this is one of the interesting challenge points that the corporate community has in thinking about funding, and that is scaling up tried and true and well-researched and also supporting out-of-the-box thinking, which is really the next wave of innovation. And different companies are answering that calculus differently in terms of how much they're willing to invest in it, and I guess that's true of the federal government as well. If we have time for a couple more questions, in the back there. Good morning. I'm Curtly Fisher from Congressman Jim Langevin's office. And my boss is really interested in cybersecurity uh, and knows that there's going to be a lot of jobs in that field. And obviously, IBM and Mattel knows that. Um, and he's obviously working on building a workforce for that. And he'd like to see a diverse workforce. And obviously, that starts really young. And I was just wondering if you could talk about what you're seeing, what the makeup of your students are, and how you're recruiting different students, boys and girls, and if there are different teaching techniques for girls or other areas? So um, we have a population, as I said, that's 95% um, black Hispanic and 5% others, 67% are male, 33% are female. Um, what strategy works differently? Um, I would definitely project, we think project-based learning, and specifically for the younger ages, are very, very important. Definitely um, teaching them the value of of networking and group skills, but also allowing and having high expectations and allowing the opportunity to, to change programs. We, for example, from September to January, our students' programs changed four times. 
because we are paying attention to the data and allowing students, um, after they have demonstrated they have met proficiency, to actually be able to take um, different types of acceleration. So whereas in our first accelerated math class, there were two females out of, there were 23 students and two were female. In our last version of an accelerated course, there are 22 students, 11 are female, 11 are male. So we are creating the opportunities in terms of within our own space that allow for the opportunity for students to really flourish, um, and specifically women in a particularly male-dominated area to feel safe enough to take the high-level math courses and be supported. Hi, I'm Julie Stiano with the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and I have a five-year-old who hopefully will one day go to one, a school like yours in D.C., so I'll keep an eye out for that. Um, you will all know that I'm new to the STEM education dialogue when I ask this question. My question is, um, it seems to me that there has to be a national solution to the STEM education problem. Um, you're working in very important ways on the local level, and I'm curious about your thoughts about a national solution and what stands in the way or what's going to, you know, that's probably a whole different session, um, but um, how you're working, how your work might feed into a national solution. God bless you for asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we started six, seven years ago with one school and then it went to 10 schools in Ohio and now it's a, a multi-state national network of 11 different uh, states with the District of Columbia and, and everybody's calling every day with new interest and, and it's not um, we have the solution but how do we want to work on this so I do think it is a national uh, it's, a, it's a national concern it's a national challenge but it's also going to be a national solution and it, it, this sounds really fluffy, but it, we, we have to work together on this whole piece. We're not going to figure it out. These two schools are excellent schools, and they're places that you want your kids, but they're not going to solve the, the big issue. I've always seen STEM as really a Trojan horse for school reform. Mm -hmm. How do you do things differently? And what you're hearing from both of these schools, it's not just science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. There's a strong liberal arts background to it, with, which emphasizes science, technology, engineering, math as a problem-solving mechanism. So uh, we're, we kind of disguise it, but we, we believe this is a school reform effort, you know, after thousands of reform efforts. But the more we can put on the pedestal these kinds of schools, they're, the more they're going to change education policy throughout the country. And I think Amy really hit it, hit it when she said that every student has to take pre-calculus. Um, there was a, re a recent report said that many students were dropping out of STEM majors because they were finding it too difficult. And a lot of the research was saying that Algebra two was the gateway course for college. And I say we need to now make that pre-calculus, if not calculus, for the protection of STEM. So we need to find a way policy-wise to make sure that every student K through 12 successfully gets to pre-calculus or calculus, then I think that we could see students definitely having a better chance fearing at STEM majors because their mathematics foundation would be stronger, unlike um, Algebra II. I, I think there's a lot of discussion also on the federal level about the importance of community colleges um, and the importance of higher education. And, um, and recently there's been talk about reauthorizing the Perkins Act and um, realigning CTE so that, it, that I think it, it's um, that our, both of our schools speak to that about you know, aligning schools with, um, with, with industry needs um, and having closer collaborations between K-12, higher education, and business and then talking about accountability and innovation. And um, that's what the new discussion is around this Perkins Act, and I think that holds promise. And then there's also organizations like Change the Equation that provide forums and give a national voice to these kinds of partnerships that I think are very important as well. So I'll take the prerogative of having the lectern just to add a footnote, and that is it'll be the pre-calculus of the 21st century, not necessarily the pre-calculus that exists in many places. So it may be an old title, but a somewhat new course. And so I, I know that's what you meant, but that's my mathematics background showing. I couldn't contain myself. Um, thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate it. Hope this is another in a successful series of salons for you. We look forward to seeing you at future meetings. Thank you. Thank you.